Well, hey man, what a joy to be back and worship with you all. It's always thrilling. Summertime, we've got a lot of people coming to visit and new folks descending, both at MPS and DLI and those vacationing from out of town. We'd like to welcome you. I want to join Sam and just extending an invitation to, to come and chat with us after the service. If you'd like to know more about our church, our ministries, and how we can serve you. And if you are joining us, uh, our church is walking through the Gospel of Luke. And so if you have a copy of the Scriptures, you want to open it to Luke chapter 5. There are plenty of Bibles in the seats there. Feel free to grab one of those. But as we uh, come back to Luke chapter 5, I want us to begin by considering this question. The question is, what did Jesus come to the earth to do? Now, you can certainly come up with some answers on your own, but there are a number of different places where it's answered for us because Jesus says explicitly, directly, this is the reason I came. For instance, when we get to Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to, you tell me, seek and save the lost. And of course, there's Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, where we'd say that's maybe the theme verse of Mark's gospel, where we read, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You flip on over to John's gospel, and there we read in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life, and not just have life, but have it abundantly. And listen, when we read those passages of Scripture from Jesus, we love those job descriptions that Jesus is a rescuer, that Jesus is a deliverer, he's a liberator, he's a sacrificial servant, Jesus is a life giver, but There's another reason why Jesus came to the earth. And just like those passages that we considered, this one is also explicit. As Jesus will say later in Luke chapter 7, as he's at the house of Simon the Pharisee, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend, of tax collectors and sinners. And which seems like a huge insult for me, I say amen and praise God that Jesus came for tax collectors and sinners. Because for those that have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, you recognize that you are a tax collector and sinner. And what I find so fascinating as we move through Luke's gospel is that when Jesus comes to save and to serve and to sacrifice himself for others, that much of his ministry is actually done at the dinner table. He's sitting down and having meals and explaining why he came and what he came to do. In fact, if you were to grab your Bible or a Bible software program and start searching a few words, like eating or reclining, what you'll find is that most of those occurrences happen in Luke's gospel. In fact, there's a book written called Eating Your Way Through Luke's Gospel. It's an interesting title. The the author is Robert Karras, and in that book, he basically describes that Jesus is either at a meal, he's going to a meal, or he's leaving a meal. You say, is that... True. Well, yeah, we just skim through the Gospel of Luke, and here we have the first account, the first recorded meal, which is significant. And then I mentioned in Luke chapter 7, there's another meal as Jesus is at the house of a Pharisee. You you fast forward to chapter 11 and verse 37, and there's a Pharisee requesting to have lunch with Jesus. In chapter 14, he's invited to a leader of the Pharisee's house to, to break some bread and get into some discussion. And then all of you are familiar with the prodigal son 
in chapter 15, when he repents and the father calls the servants to throw a huge feast and to celebrate. There's also Luke chapter 19, as he goes to not this tax collector's house, but Zacchaeus' house. And again, there's a, a big celebration and a meal, and who can forget that great dinner that last night with Jesus and his men at the Last Supper. And so as you begin to read Luke's gospel, you realize that, yes, much of his ministry actually happens at the dinner table. And these things, just by way of reminder, they're recorded for our instruction. They're recorded for our edification. We, we want to eavesdrop in on these dinner conversations because at the dinner conversations, we learn about Jesus' nature. He says, I have come. That's even proclaiming his pre-incarnate deity. What did he come to do? Who did he come to seek? All of these things reveal the kingdom of God, the character of God, that Jesus is forgiving and he's generous and he's gracious and he's joyful and he's all about correcting false notions about him and his kingdom. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pull up a chair and we're going to sit front row at this dinner table as Jesus calls sinners to repentance. So would you please stand with me and one more time as we honor God's word and we're going to read Luke chapter 5 starting there in verse 27 and moving down to 32. Here once again is God's word. It says this, And after that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he left everything behind and rose up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. You may have a seat. Would you please join me as we go before the Lord and ask him, once again, for his help. Let's pray. Oh, Father, would you please enlighten our hearts? Help us, God, to have understanding of what is communicated here by the power of your Spirit. And Lord, may we not just learn something new, something interesting, something that we can even communicate to others, God, but may we be changed, transformed. Fill us with joy, fill us with gratitude, Lord, and where appropriate, Fill us with faith to believe that Jesus did come to seek and save the lost. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, if you're taking notes, here's our main idea for this morning. And it really comes straight from the text. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You say, well, what does that have to do with me? Well, you have to decide which one of the two you are. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And you have to decide which one of the two you are. You see, there's only one great physician that can heal disease, death. And it's a death sentence of death, and that is sin. Sin causes death. Jesus is the only one that could defeat sin. But that healing, listen, it's only for those who acknowledge that they are in need of a physician. And so our outline as we work through the text is, is pretty simple. We're going to look at first Jesus calling Levi, his call in verse 27. And then we'll look at Levi complying in verse 28. Then Levi compels the Pharisees complain in verse 30. And then Jesus closes the section here by clarifying. So Jesus calls. He says to Levi, follow me. Levi complies. Levi follows him. Levi is compelled now, now that he's following Jesus. He wants others to follow Jesus. The Pharisees don't like this. They don't want others to follow Jesus, so they complain and criticize. And then Jesus clarifies by saying, this is the very reason why I came, so that sinners can follow me. 
Well, there's our outline. Let's begin with point number one, Jesus calls. It says there, and after that, this is simply a time marker. It tells us that Jesus' encounter with Levi comes on the heels of a series of miracles that we've studied over the last several weeks. But the healing of the paralytic, like we looked at last time, is markedly different than what we've seen previous. You say, well, what's different? Well, Jesus' authority to cast out demons was amazing. His ability to cast out a fever, to, to catch fish, all of those things were fantastic. Cleansing a leper? No one has ever seen anything like this before. But what makes the healing of the paralytic so interesting is what he says when he does it. Which is easier to say? Get up and walk or your sins are forgiven. And you remember his response there in verse 24. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and picking up your stretcher, go home. Listen, no one does, no one says these kinds of things. And the Pharisees actually got it right. This would be blasphemy if it were not coming from the mouth of God himself. But Jesus proves he has the authority to heal, to cleanse, to restore. And all of those physical healings that we saw weeks ago are really just a spiritual picture a spiritual reality that Jesus is fulfilling his mission statement, just as he said. Look back over to Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. That's where we learned about Jesus' mission statement. We recited ours here this morning. Jesus has his own. It's there in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recover sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And now, again, he's fulfilling this very mission statement he claimed back in the synagogue in his hometown. So that's the timing. And now, what does Jesus see? Well, it says here, he went out and noticed a tax collector. And that word there, translated notice, is it's not just a casual glance. No, what Jesus does is he actually fixes his eye on Levi with divine intentionality. See, there, there's plenty of people around Jesus. There's, there's crowds always around Jesus at this point. But Jesus sets his sights on Levi because it's time for this man's life to be totally transformed. You say, well, what do we know about Levi? We'll start with his genes, Levi's genes. <laughs> he may have descended from the tribe of Levi. You say, well, Dom, why is that significant? Well, not always, but oftentimes, parents would name their children after dad or after grandpa or uh, after uh, the, the tribe that they came from. And you say, well, what about the tribe of Levi? Well, you remember that comes from the Aaronic priesthood, which means that maybe, just maybe, maybe Levi was supposed to be a priest. And if he chose a tax collector over a priest, that just tells you how far this guy may have fallen. But, but even if that's not the case, he chose the life of a tax collector. And you say, well, was this the guy who was one of the 12 disciples? What's interesting, when you look at the list of disciples, that Levi is actually not listed. And that's why some commentators have said that he wasn't actually a disciple. But when you look at the parallel accounts of both Mark and Matthew, we see that Matthew was the son of Alphaeus, and Matthew and Levi are essentially the same. And so Levi is Matthew. You say, why do they do that? Why are there so many names? Well, Peter, Simon, Cephas, uh, you've got Saul, you've got Paul, you've got Joseph, who's also called Barnabas. That's just the way we roll. Dom, Dominic, Dominator, call me what you want. It's all the same guy. Now it says here that he's at a tax collector office. And when you hear that word, just tax collector, what do you think immediately of? You say, boo. IRS, we, hate, we don't hate you, IRS folks, if you work for the IRS. We love you very much. But you need to know that these kinds of folks were considered traitors. I mean, they were hated with vehement hatred. And some were worse than others. So, for instance, Zacchaeus is a different kind of tax collector. 
Uh, Zacchaeus is what they would call a archetones, the chief tax collector, whereas Levi is just a talones, a tax collector. Levi would probably have to report to someone like Zacchaeus, who is at a higher rank than he. And normally, when we look at the scriptures, we tend to think about the Pharisees, the, the scribes, maybe the Sadducees being the bad guys. But really, in the Jewish mindset, the real bad guys are the tax collectors. They were hated, despised. They were evil. You say, well, why were they hated so much? Well, just put plainly, Levi was a sellout. He was a sellout. I mean, he's working for the enemy. He's on the enemy's payroll. He's working for the IRRS, the Imperial Roman Revenue Service. Maybe the only other person who might get this is my son, but in Star Wars, they say imperial scum. The Zalots wanted to kill people who were traitors, which is fascinating when you consider who's on Jesus' team and who picked Jesus' team. He did. He's got Zalots and a tax collector as one of the 12 disciples. But the, again, these men were hated. They were traitors. And not just that. That's not the worst part. The worst part is that Levi is a Jew. He's working for Gentiles now, for Herod Antipas. He's working for the ones that are opposing and oppressing Israel. You say, well, what would that be like? Well, that would be like a Jew working in a concentration camp for the Nazis. That's what that's like. That's why they were so hated. What a sellout, traitor, dirty scum. And when you read, uh, in the first century, they had all kinds of words for them. In the Talmud, they talked about how tax collectors like the unclean beast of the Old Testament, they were referred to as extortioners, hucksters. One writer even said that they were shepherds of fornication. And there's all kinds of other colorful names, but you get the picture. And within Judaism, look, even the liberals and the conservatives, which like our day, and liberals and conservatives don't agree on anything, but back then they agreed that it's perfectly justified for you to lie to a tax collector. You can sin if you're sinning against a tax collector. It was even believed that if a tax collector had truly repented, that they would die immediately afterwards. And if they didn't die, then it was an indication that they were lying. This is the kind of reputation a tax collector has. You say, well, that doesn't seem like a great career choice. Well, it, it's a great career choice if you love money. It's a great career choice if you have no morals. It's a great career choice if you've got no problem ruining people's lives. And so that tells you a little something about Levi. Yeah, this was a lucrative job. There's no regulations. You could charge whatever you want. You see someone walking towards you, charge them up. Tax them. Tax him on his food, tax him on his fish, tax him on his cart, tax him on the wheels. That's what they did. But I don't want you to think of them like just IRS agents because they're really like mobsters. You make a complaint, I'm going to tax you for the complaint. You got a problem, I'm going to get my muscle, the Romans, to come beat you up. Tax collectors, swindlers, those who took bribes, those who cheated, those who loved corruption. Even Jesus himself, when he's talking about church discipline in Matthew 18, you remember what he says? And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a what? A Gentile and a tax collector. Now all of this raises the question, then what in the world is Jesus doing calling a tax collector, to follow after him. It seems so counterintuitive. Not just counterintuitive, it seems like a dumb plan. Why, why would you get a guy like that with that kind of reputation to come and associate with the rabbi? Of course, Jesus, he knows Levi is immoral. He knows that he's dishonest. He knows that he's hated. And listen, that's what makes 
his calling of Levi so sweet because he knows Levi. He knows his sin. And he calls him anyway. He calls him into relationship. He calls him to a life out of sin, to be transformed, to become a follower of Christ. Now, the religious leaders, they wanted a Messiah who was going to come and fight Rome, not ask Rome to follow after him. You see, everyone wanted the Messiah to take down the Roman impression. And Jesus just got through saying that he's the son of man. And if we're thinking correctly and biblically and accurately about Daniel chapter 7, this one has all sovereign rule and authority. So he's the one that is going to put down Rome. And so we want him to fight. And so maybe when he's looking at Levi at the tax booth, maybe people are like, yeah, go get him, Jesus. Go flip some tables. Go smack that guy around. But instead of hating Levi, Jesus has a heart for him. Instead of fighting with him, he says, follow me. Now, I love this word. This is such a a great word and worth our consideration. Akolu It just literally means to walk the same road or to move behind someone in the same direction. You see, the command, follow me, it's a clear call to be a disciple. But R.C. Sproul says that before we jump to just thinking about discipleship, think a little literal here. Let me me read you this quote from R.C. He says, rabbis in the ancient world, that's what they call a peripatetic teacher. He would move about the countryside with a group of students around him, and they would follow him wherever he went. As Jesus walked down the street or through the community, the disciples would walk along or behind him, committing to memory the words he uttered. The disciple was a person who joined himself to the company of a rabbi and was committed to mastering whatever it was that the rabbi could transmit to him by way of teaching. That word, disciple, is the word mathetes, which means simply learner. A disciple of Christ is one who studies under Christ, who submits himself to the teaching of Jesus, who listens as the master speaks, who seeks to understand what the master is saying and to emulate the response that the master requires. And then R.C. says, the life of a disciple is one of service and of study and of obedience. And so when Jesus calls him to himself, that is what he is calling Levi to, complete and total life change. Your life is no longer your own. I want you to follow me. And that present active indicative is just a reminder that it's not today or this week or for a month, but he's saying, follow me forever. And so Jesus commands Levi, follow me. You say, well, what does Levi do? Well, verse 28, point number two, Levi complies. It says there, and he left everything behind and rose up and began to follow him. I I keep coming back to how many gasps must have happened in chapter four and five. You say gasp, yeah, a bunch of fish just pop out of nowhere. (gasps) What was that? I've never seen that before. Jesus reaching out, stretching his hand to touch a leper. Imagine the gasp when Jesus did that. There's this collective gasp all over the place, healing a paralytic, saying that someone's sins can be forgiven. Well, this is no different. A Jewish rabbi claiming to be the Messiah, calling a Jewish traitor and tax collector to be his disciple. And when we look at Levi's response, it is utterly astonishing because he doesn't, hmm, interesting, Jesus. Let me think about it. There's others who will come up with excuses for following Jesus. Uh, my dad just died. Let me, go, let me go bury my dad. I've got a business here. Let me go figure that out. No, what he does is the text says he immediately, he gets up and follows after him. I mean, don't you have some questions? Where are we going? How long are we gone? How am I going to provide for myself? If I leave my booth, who's going to pay for my food? There's all kinds of questions Levi could have asked. We don't get any of that. What we get is what the writer 
the Spirit of God wants us to understand is that he just got up and followed after him. That doesn't just say something about Levi's commitment, which is amazing, but it says something about the compelling nature of Jesus. It says something about his character. It says something about his person. This is a guy that I, I want to follow. Now, friends, if Christ is calling you, don't hesitate. Don't put this off. Don't think that some other time is going to be a more convenient time. That might not be the case. I remember thinking, oh, when I get out of high school, okay, when I graduate from college, and people go down this road of just pushing when I get married, when I get a job, when I buy a house, when I have another car, when I'm a grandparent, when I retire. And there's a whole string of people, countless people that have said, not yet, that are in hell. If Jesus calls you, don't wait. Someone said delinquents don't make good disciples. Now, the question we have is, what would this have meant for Levi? Well, Matthew and Mark says that he arose and followed him, but Luke gives more detail. Look there again at the text. It says, and he left everything behind. What did it mean for Levi to leave everything? The, the terminology is pointing us to this de decisive break. He's completely left his former way of life. And, and the word here, I, I love the word, is kata lepo. The preposition kata is intensifying or strengthen the verb, which is lepo, which means to totally abandon, to totally leave behind. We, we come across this word a couple of times in Scripture, and so you'll be familiar with this one, that we are to abandon family. You say, where does it say that? Well, a man should kata lepo his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The same thing when Moses, he left Egypt, it says there in Hebrews eleven six 6, regarding the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking for a reward. And so Moses, kata lepo, Egypt. The, the disciples say, hey, look, we can't neglect the word of God to serve tables. Same idea. Peter and Andrew so far left their boats, left their business. John and James, the sons of Zebedee, left their father, left their business. And here, Levi walks away from all the financial security. He, he walks away from all of his muscle. Where is he going to go? Because you're not just walking back to the Jews and be like, hey, guys, sorry. No, he's going to be hated by both groups. You think about a Jew who has tax collector on his resume. Where is he going to get a job? In Israel. I mean, think about what it meant for him to walk away from all of those things. He must have had a good reason. You see, because what mattered to him <clears throat> was not the regrets of losing money, but was the relief that this guy is no ordinary man, that this guy has the power to forgive sins, that this guy can satisfy my life, can bring me joy, can bring me peace. And so Levi joyfully, I don't think reluctantly, joyfully gets up and follows after him. And to think about this, for so long, I'm sure that he was taught maybe from friends or what he heard from the synagogue was that God does not love you. That you are too sinful for God to save you. I remember having a conversation with my neighbor. That was his argument. God's not going to forgive me because he doesn't know all that I've done. Wait a second. Are we talking about the same God here? He doesn't know what you've done? You say the proof is in the pudding. The proof is on the cross. Jesus died to forgive all of your sins even the sins that you're unaware that you committed. This lesson for us is a lesson of exhilaration. It should exhilarate your heart that Jesus forgives the worst of the worst. 
Well, Levi, he trades this financial security, but it makes sense because he's got a greater reward. Willing to leave this because this is better. And that's exactly what he does. And it should remind us of Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9. For whoever wishes to save his life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is it a profit? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? But it's also interesting to note that there's an order here of Levi becoming a disciple because it's not just him forsaking everything, but it's also him forsaking and following. So it is a twofold action. There are lots of people who kick the habits and kick the drugs and kick the pornography and they just take on something else and become addicted to that thing. But there's a twofold action here. So positionally now, he's going to be justified. And practically speaking, he's going to be sanctified. Friends, if you want to know what it means to be a Christian, you can boil it down to this. You need to be justified. How do you know that you're justified? There's going to be some evidence of a justified life. You're going to be sanctified. Not perfect. But it's not about how perfect you are as much as it is the direction. Which direction are you going? Anyone who claims Christ, anyone who calls themselves a Christian, if you are not walking in step with Jesus, if you are not truly following him, you need to examine yourself. You need to examine your walk. John in chapter 8, verse 12, he said, Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows after me will never walk in darkness. You want some evidence to know if you're truly a follower? Are you walking in darkness? Yes or no? Galatians 5.16, I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. You you want to have some evidence to know if you're truly walking after Jesus? Are you walking by the Spirit or are you feeling the desires of the flesh? Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Are you following in other people's example of godliness and holiness and truth? Just some helpful reminders when you say, I don't know what it means to, to walk after Jesus. Well, do you look like him? Do you think like him? Do you act like him? And it's hard to do all those things if you're not in the word of God. Well, listen, if again, if you're visiting, you need to hear that being a disciple of Jesus is more than just coming on a Sunday. Well, that, that could be part of it, but it demands your whole life, not just when it's convenient for you, but, but you are dedicated, devoted to giving yourself fully and faithfully to Jesus. The, the commentator, Matton, said this, Matthew no longer listens to the drumbeat of Rome or to the crescendo of coins in a bag. No, Matthew abandoned his lucrative job, his power, his authority, his prestige, among other tax collectors and Roman officials to march to the drumbeat of Jesus Christ. He said this, marching to the drumbeat of a different drummer involves the identification of the power value of material possessions compared to spiritual matters. Matthew saw the greater value value in following Christ than in making money. And so it was decisive. Well, Levi does more than follow. He throws this big banquet for his friends. And he makes Jesus the honored guest because he wants to celebrate this call to discipleship by calling his companions to come and celebrate with him. And so he throws a party. And this leads us to our next point, Levi compels in verse 29 it says and Levi gave a big reception for him in his house see what he did he's as happy as can be and what do you do when you're happy and ecstatic about something you go and share it with others he lays out this huge spread this isn't like coming to the Avila home for grace group where we just have like a couple hors d'oeuvres some chips and salsa like this is a full-on full course meal that he's provided, and you say, well, wait a second, I thought it said that he left everything behind. That's a good question. Did he leave everything behind? Because he's still got a house, and he's still got money to pay for all these things. And it's important to note that when you leave everything behind, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sell everything that you have, but you certainly have to be willing to do that. 
So listen, it's, it's more than relinquishing your possessions. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is all about repurposing all of your possessions, which means that you might sell everything, but you might not. But whether or not you sell, whatever you have is now in service to make much of King Jesus. And that's what we see here. Levi, he has left all of his old loyalties, and the relationships have now changed. He's abandoned an old lifestyle, and now new habits begin to form. New affections begin to come to the surface. And the first thing that he wants to do, which really is an indication of the fruit of repentance, is he wants to tell others about Jesus. That's what he wants to do. The text says there that there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. And that word there translated others is alos, which is just others of the same kind, which means that these are also people who are ostracized. These are also people that the religious leaders have given up on. But Levi has this immediate sense and this intense evangelistic zeal. Listen, I found a guy who can forgive sins. I found a guy who can restore life. And so he does, by instinct, what all of us should do, which is tell others about Jesus. Tell others about Jesus. What a fruit of genuine repentance and salvation is that you want others to embrace him as well. And when we think about what's happening here, the whole concept again of him Sitting down and eating, it's not socially acceptable to sit down with tax collectors and sinners, right? But the text tells us that Jesus just doesn't kind of do a flyby as a drive through meal. Look at the text. It says he's reclining, which is just a way to say that he's invested in these people. He's giving them their, his time and attention. He's answering questions. He's dialoguing with these people. And the Pharisees, listen, they would never do that. They they were appalled to be around these kinds of people. I mean, to conduct business with a non-believer, that's that's one thing. But to sit down and have a meal in your home or to invite people into your home that are sinners, that's something else. You're communicating more than just sharing a meal. No, no. You're not just feeding the belly. You're, you're fostering fellowship. You're saying, this is my friend. And so again, the, the Pharisees would never even think about doing something like this. But what Levi says is, look, sinners, friends, we are great sinners. But today at the dinner table, we have a greater Savior. It was John Wesley that said, no man ever went to heaven alone. He must either find friends or make friends. Jesus reclining at the table with these sinners was just a powerful way to communicate to them and to us the kind of love and grace and compassion and mercy that Jesus extends to all. So listen, if you're a follower of Christ, each of you have your own unique sphere of influence, but I want you to recognize something that for your parents or your family members or your neighbors or your classmates or people on your sports team, you might be the closest thing to Jesus that they'll see. And so if you have these ongoing long relationships and people don't even know that you're a Christian, something is very, very wrong. Uh, I have Brother Aubrey here from Abu Dhabi. The long, long, long way to come to church. But they're here for just a couple of weeks as they're making rounds to other churches. And Aubrey said what many others have said who have come to visit our church. Your church is so hospitable. People opening up their homes, feeding us. Brothers and sisters, I love hearing that. And we need to excel still more. But when we think about hospitality, technically it's stranger-loving. I think we're really good at loving one another. We, we are. We were excelling at loving one another. But I want to challenge you. Push on the button a little bit. Do you have people like this coming into your home? Are you inviting non-Christians 
just for the sake of feeding them some tacos and telling them about Jesus? Are you praying like the Apostle Paul when he prayed in Colossians? Pray at the same time for us as well that God will open a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of Christ. He says that we would walk in wisdom toward outsiders, redeeming the time. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should answer each person. Listen, Brother and sister, are you letting your light shine so people might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven? Well, we learn also that this isn't a private meal. Take a look there. How do we know this? Well, because this party has now attracted all kinds of attention. The Pharisees are present, and it's the scribes of the Pharisees that are there. They're listening in on the discussion But like a bunch of hard-hearted skeptics sitting in a church service, these guys are there not to try to gain understanding, but to undermine everything that Jesus is doing and saying. It says there, verse 30, And the Pharisees and their scribes, they began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And this leads us to point number four. The Pharisees complain. And notice that their complaint is not actually to Jesus. They don't go to him. Who do they go to? They go to his disciples, and they criticize the master to the disciples. And their criticism is not constructive. No, it's actually condemning. Why is he doing this? If he was really a godly man, he wouldn't be doing this. You see, the Pharisees, they were concerned primarily about contamination And contamination happens, that we learn with the leopard, in proximity. You touch a sinner, you become a sinner. That's their fear. Their their fear is guilt by association. But Jesus comes, and not only does he associate with lepers and outcasts, but again, he's eating with them, dining with them, and that is what enraged these Pharisees. But really, their complaint, it reveals their hearts. Their pride is a fruit of unbelief, complaining against God, judging others, sentencing people, condemning them. It's a clear indication that they didn't understand God's grace and mercy. They they didn't want them to be forgiven. They wanted them to be punished. The full letter of the law. But listen, I got to tell you this, because often when we look at the Pharisees and the scribes, we say, go get them, Jesus. But I just want to remind you that they wanted to see the covenant promises fulfilled. That they wanted the Messiah to come. That they wanted the kingdom. But what they didn't understand is that the kingdom is only for those who recognize that they are sinners. And that is the problem. So I hate their criticism, but I love that they ask this question because the question is, how can a godly person, how can a holy person, how can a pure person be around sinners and praise God that Jesus being holy and godly and pure was willing to come and be amongst sinners like you and I? And he can do it. He can be completely unstained and not be isolated from sinners. He, he can be together with sinners, but be untouched by their sin. And this incident it ends with an important clarification by Jesus. Look there in verses 31 and 32. It says, And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so Jesus responds to their criticism with some criticism of his own, but it's kind of couched in irony here. You see, listen, you you don't call a doctor unless something's wrong with you. So you guys remember when I was sitting here preaching because I tore my Achilles, and right after I tore my Achilles, I started having some really bad chest pain. I thought, is this a heart attack? What's going on? Is this indigestion? Is this constipation? What What is going on? So I had a call, my doctor, Dr. Tim, well, PA, almost. So I call Tim, and I say, Tim, man, I'm not sleeping at all. Every time I lie down, my chest hurts. It's like to the point of tears. I'm really struggling. 
and I'm not sleeping. I need you to come. So Tim comes and does his little examining, and we figure out a few things. Tim, I'm going to butcher this word because this is one of those technical words. Costa chondritis? Costco. Costco. I had Costco. Costco chondritis. I had an inflammation in the cartilage that connects the rib to the breastbone, and on top of that, I had bronchitis. And I wasn't going to get any better unless I actually saw a doctor. And once I did, well, let's, let's get this thing fixed. But, but do you see the problem here? If you keep saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, then you'll never call on a doctor, and therefore you won't be healed. And that is Jesus' point. He's not saying that they're actually righteous. He's saying you think that you're righteous. And when you think that you're righteous, you have no need for what? For righteousness. Because you got it on your own. And what Jesus is saying is, look, if you're depending on your own righteousness, that will damn you. Listen, you might be here this morning and you think that you are perfectly fine. Don't walk away from this morning thinking that you're fine if you're not really fine. John Calvin says, such is our innate pride. We always seem to ourselves just and upright and wise and holy until we're convinced by clear evidence of our injustice, vileness, folly, and impurity. And that is why we preach and sing what we do. He goes on, For since we are all naturally prone to hypocrisy, any empty semblance of righteousness is quite enough to satisfy us instead of righteousness itself. And so I just want to challenge you. Do do you think that you're spiritually rich when in fact you're spiritually bankrupt? That is a form of deception that we don't want you to have. Levi knew the only qualification for me to follow after Jesus is for me to bring my sin to the table and for it to be forgiven by him. What a great story. This encounter with Levi And again, while there's so much we can learn about Levi's obedience and the way he just got up and left everything to follow Jesus, the story is really not about Levi's obedience and his following. The story is about the one who is worthy of our obedience and following. You see, Luke chapter 5 shows us a number of miracles. We see all of this great power, the power to provide, the power to heal sickness, disease, cast out demons, to cleanse, to restore health, But let's never forget that all the healing comes back to that middle layer of the chiasm in chapter 5. And that question, who is this that blasphemes who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, the one who can forgive sins is Jesus. He is the only way that we can be forgiven, that we can be justified, that we can be made right with God, and he is the only way who can permanently change your mind, your heart, and your eternity. For those of you that know him, let's pray and thank him. For those of you that don't, don't leave today without talking to me or another one of our members. Let's pray. Father, sin is deceptive. It's wicked. It makes us think something about ourselves that is often not true. And Lord, how terrifying for any of us to walk away thinking that we are healthy when we are in fact not. Father, for so many years, I thought that I was right with you because of church attendance, because I wasn't doing as bad the things that my friends were doing, because I turned on the TV and saw murderers and rapists and thought to myself, well, I'm not that bad. Oh, but Father, how your word brings conviction and clarity and exposes our bankruptcy 
It reveals our total depravity and our need for cleansing, for redemption, for salvation. Oh God, would you please impress this narrative, this story upon our hearts to cause us either, God, to be so thankful that you come to save sinners and we've experienced that salvation and therefore can rejoice. Oh Lord, would you weigh heavy by the power of your spirit, bring so much conviction and weight and turmoil of soul for those that have yet to bow the knee to King Jesus. We pray this in his glorious name. Amen.